I'm Donna Nelson at the University of Oklahoma, and this is a lecture for my Organic Chemistry 1 class. Um, we are covering here the final lecture for Chapter 1, a review of general chemistry, electrons, bonds, and molecular properties. So we've already done the first two lectures. This is the third lecture. So here we're going to discuss dipole moments and molecular polarity, intermolecular forces and physical properties, and solubility. So first, the electronegativity di differences result in polar bonds, and uh, the polar bonds can greatly influence how uh, the reactions take place. The electronegativity differences cause induction, so that is the shifting of electrons within an orbital, and that results in a dipole moment in the molecule. The dipole moment is the amount of partial charge. It's calculated by the amount of partial charge times the distance between the two charges. The dipole moments are reported in units of debye. A debye is equal to 10 to the minus 18 electrostatic units times centimeters. What would the dipole moment be if uh, chloromethane were 100% ionic? So if it were 100% ionic, the, the um, dipole moment would be a full charge times the distance between the carbon and chlorine. So the distance between carbon and chlorine in this molecule is 1.772 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. So a full charge is 4.8 times 10 to the minus 10 electrostatic units. So if you multiply these two together, it's here, which is 8.51 debye. What percent of the carbon chlorine bond is ionic? So it turns out that if you calculate this, 22% of 22% tells you that this bond is 22% uh, ionic. That means that this is mostly a covalent bond and also electron density will be pulled off of carbon onto chlorine. And this makes sense because think about chlorine, it's the third most electronegative atom in the periodic table. And it is attached to carbon, which is not very um, electronegative. For molecules with multiple bond, polar bonds, the dipole moment is the vector sum of all the individual dipole moments. So this shows the individual dipole moments. Each one of these bonds will be polarized and the molecular dipole moment will be a sum. And so you can see that it's coming out. This arrow is bisecting the two carbon chlorine bonds and um, it will be less. I mean, you calculated these things in physics, I'm sure. Uh, here is the net dipole moment for ammonia and the net or molecular dipole moment for water is depicted here. It's the vector sum of all of these. So nitrogen and oxygen are uh, highly electronegative atoms also. And so electron density will be pulled onto those from uh, their hydrogens. So this is an electrostatic potential map. We'll use these um, throughout the course and even in 2 or 2. And so you can see that the more red depicts uh, higher electronegativity or, or higher negative charge. This is chlorine uh, right in here. This molecule is drawn inside this electrostatic potential map. And this is the legend that shows more negative, more positive, and uh, that tells you that the electron density is being pulled off of carbon onto chlorine. This end of the molecule is partially negative. This end of the molecule is partially 
positive. Dipole moments for um, other organic compounds are given in Table 1.5, and you can see these are in order, and so you can see that acetone is um, has a fairly high dipole moment uh, going down to ethanol, do, and methanol and ethanol do not have such a high dipole moment. And then you go on down to the molecules that are more symmetric. You can see the more symmetric the molecule, the lower the dipole in here. There is no um, highly electronegative atom, and so there's no dipole. Here you have highly electronegative atoms in the carbon tetrachloride, but they are all pointing in two opposite directions, and so the vector sum is zero. Each individual atom, uh, carbon chlorine bond, will be polarized, but the vector sum is zero. Hydrogen bonding is the attractive force between a hydrogen, which is bonded to an electronegative atom, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. So hydrogen bonding occurs when hydrogen is attached to a highly electronegative atom, usually nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Occasionally, but rarely, chlorine also can serve. Um, so that hydrogen is attached to one of these, and it interacts with the lone pair on another highly electronegative atom. Hydrogen bonds are strong because the partial positive and partial negative charges are relatively large. When a hydrogen shares electrons with a highly electronegative atom, it will carry a large partial positive charge. That large partial positive on the hydrogen can attract the large partial negative charges on other molecules. So here you can see it. There's a large partial positive on this hydrogen bonded to oxygen, um, and it is attracted to the partial ne negative that uh, is created by these lone, the uh, electrons in the lone pair um, on oxygen. But even with these large charges, and these are fairly large for organic chemistry, even the, with these large charges, the hydrogen bonds are still about 20 times weaker than covalent bonds. Although uh, hydrogen bonding is the uh, strongest of the intermolecular forces in organic chemistry. So hydrogen bonding is um, important. And here this is depicted um, between two molecules of ammonia. This is depicted between two molecules of uh, water. When it's taking place between two molecules of the same compound, like two water molecules or two ammonia molecules, then um, that can impact the boiling point of those compounds. Solvents that engage in hydrogen bonding are called protic because they have the protons. If they do not have the protons attached to the highly electronegative atoms, then they cannot participate in hydrogen bonding. And so, uh, at least not by being a proton donor. And so, in that case, they are called aprotic because they don't have the protons attached to the highly electronegative atoms. Hydrogen bonding increasing the amount and extent of the hydrogen bonding explains why the following isomers have different boiling points. So here there's no um, proton attached to nitrogen. Here you have one proton attached to nitrogen. Here you have two protons um, bonded to nitrogen. Notice all of these have the same molecular weights. They all have the same formula and same molecular weights, but they do not have the same boiling points. The boiling points vary wildly. Um, so 
boiling points can depend on uh, the molecular weight of the compound. Um, the larger the molecular weight, the higher the boiling point usually. But here, these are all the same molecular weights. So that's not going to impact the boiling points. That's not contributing to the boiling point differences. But hydrogen bonding does. So here, there's no hydrogen on nitrogen. Here you have one hydrogen on nitrogen, and here you have two. So there's going to be a greater uh, possibility and greater degree of hydrogen bonding if there are two hydrogens bonded to nitrogen than if there is just one hydrogen bonded to nitrogen. So here you have two hydrogens that can participate in hydrogen bonding, and the hydrogen bonding will hold two molecules of this one compound together. It will make them sort of um, attract each other. So the hydrogen on one molecule will be attracted to the lone pair on another molecule. Here the hydrogen on this molecule will be attracted to the nitrogen, the lone pair on nitrogen in another molecule. So as you increase the amount of hydrogen bonding, you increase the amount of interaction between two molecules of that compound. And so when one starts to boil that compound, um, more heat will have to be put in in order to supply the energy to break those bonds. So the hydrogen bonding will have to be broken, broken up, so that those molecules can exist as um, separate gas molecules in the vapor phase. And so that's what's happening when um, a liquid is converted to a gas, so a liquid is converted to the vapor phase, and that means that the, the hydrogen bonding that has been taking place between two molecules must be broken, and more energy is taken, uh, is consumed in order to break those hydrogen bonds, and that means that one has to turn the energy up. So you have to supply that energy as a um, more heat so that uh, happens, registers as a higher boiling point. Hydrogen bonding is also responsible, uh, at least partially, for the uh, DNA to form a double helix, and it's, re it's um, responsible for some proteins to fold into an alpha helix. Dipole-dipole attractions um, happen when the polar molecules line up their opposite charges. So here you can see acetylene. Notice you have a CO double bond, partially negative near oxygen, partially positive near carbon because oxygen pulls the electron density through these bonds from carbon onto oxygen. So oxygen will be richer in electron density. And so the molecules will have a tendency to line up. Negative, positive, and here the negative is attracted to that positive. Negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, with the negative being attracted to the positive in the molecule next to it. <clears throat> so this creates the dipole um, in acetone. So you have these dipole-dipole attractions between these molecules. And so that causes the molecules to um, be uh, attracted to each other. And once again, a higher boiling point will be required. The greater energy supplied in a higher boiling point will be required to break these interactions and convert acetone into the vapor phase where the molecules are no longer associated to each other. Isobutylene, all carbon. 
acetone. Here you have a highly electronegative atom in the oxygen. <clears throat> Notice the difference in boiling points. This is 6.9. Notice the difference here. It's 56.3. Um, melting points. Also, this is the this has a higher melting point. But melting points are difficult to use um, when comparing um, attractive forces. Boiling points are much easier to use in these analyses. Melting points are more difficult. Here it happens to work because the molecules have the same shape. But if the molecules have slightly different shapes, this melting point comparison might not work because uh, in, for a melting point, you're having to consider the solids. And in the solids, you also have to consider how they pack together as um, solids. But here it's working because these have the same shapes. <coughs> but you will not always see the increase in melting points um, just because the molecules have these associations among their own mo um, molecules of the same compound. You will see this affect the boiling point always. That will be uh, consistent. London dispersion forces. So the London dispersion forces, these are the smallest of the um, intermolecular forces. This is due to an induced dipole moment, and it's transient. It moves around. The nonpolar molecules normally have their electrons spread out evenly around the nuclei, and they are balancing the charge. But the electrons are in constant random motion within their molecular orbitals. And so here, for example, look, this is one, two, three, four, five, pentane. The constant random motion of the electrons in the molecule will sometimes produce an electron distribution that is not evenly balanced. So you can see how just for an instant, if there is an excess of electron density at one end of the molecule, it will create a partial negative. And that will induce a partial positive in the molecule next door. And these molecules will become attracted to each other, but that's just for an instant. So um, the electrons, remember, are in constant random motion. And so these uh, partial negative charges will move. They'll move around the molecule. And so um, this molecule may be attracted to another molecule or another molecule as these negative charges move around they may induce partial positive charges to other molecules and not just this one. But instantaneously, this is what is happening. And um, you might think, well, if these are so weak and they're so transient, um, then is there really much of an impact? But the answer is yes. Note, this is pentane. And so this is very close to uh, you can think of it as close to octane. So um, octane, remember, is part of gasoline. So um, octane has no um, highly electronegative atoms in it. So uh, every time you go put gasoline in your car, you're putting some octane into your car. And... Um, I don't know if you've thought about it, but, uh, you know, your gasoline is liquid. And even though it has no highly electronegative atoms in it, it's still a liquid. So there's no hydrogen bonding and no charged dipole to hold those molecules together. It's this that is holding those molecules together and making it be a gas instead, uh, sorry, making it be a liquid instead of uh, a gas, and I mean a vapor. So um, that's what keeps it from just vaporizing. So these London dispersion forces um, are the reasons why molecules with more mass generally have higher boiling points. So butane, pentane, 
Heck saying, look at the boiling point, zero, 36 to 69. So this is hexane. Um, and as the masses get higher, the boiling points continue to get higher. This is a general trend. The more branching, however, um, destroys that to some extent. This, here you have nice surface area where these molecules can sort of um, get close to each other. You know, the, the linear molecule can get close to the next linear molecule. And so the, the uh, more surface area they have uh, interacting, the greater the London dispersion, dispersion forces will be. If you have branching, these molecules can't get up so close to each other. They can't um, have a lot of surface area that uh, touches each other, and so the boiling points diminish. The more branching it is, so here you have five carbons, here you have five carbons, here you have five carbons, and you can see the way that the boiling point has diminished because of the branching. That's because the surface area here has diminished. Uh, the, the London dispersion forces work better if you have a linear structure that has a lot of surface area so the molecules can sort of get next to each other. And so solubilities, as you learned in general chemistry, like dissolves like. It will still be that way in organic. Uh, the polar compounds generally mix well with other polar compounds. And um, if they all are capable of hydrogen bonding or strong dipole-dipole, then there's no destabilizing interactions when they mix. Uh, nonpolar compounds generally mix well with other nonpolar compounds. And so um, no strong attractions must be broken in order to allow them to mix. So in solubilities, um, think of this. One molecule, this is the way uh, soap works, by the way. One molecule uh, can have a very um, polar group at one end. So here you have a carboxylate functionality, and notice this ion. So this is an ionic, think of it as an ionic head on this molecule with a very long nonpolar tail. And so this will dissolve easily in water, and this does not. And so the molecule that has a very um, polar or even ionic head uh, can drag the uh, nonpolar end of the molecule into water if that nonpolar end is not too uh, long. And so let's look here at the way. Here is the polar head of the molecule, and here's the nonpolar tails of the molecules all clustered together, and the nonpolar tails can associate or even dissolve in oil uh, globules or oil molecules, and so thereby um, isolate them. And so this is the way that uh, the soap um, works. And so this um, ends the uh, review of general chemistry. This is the end of the third and final lecture for your general chemistry review. And so um, I hope that you have uh, enjoyed this brief review of the general chemistry. And so now you'll be aware of the concepts that you need to know going forward into our course.